we know a lot more about green technology here than what the rest of the country does, but I think it's really cool that people are moving here because they're interested in that, and they want to be good stewards of the mountains. Um, just the premise of the class is that uh, we're designing a green home, we're building a green home. I've got hundreds, if not thousands, of builders that are wanting to be good stewards of building, and then what happens is the client moves in, and that process is disrupted. It stopped. They moved into a green home, and they don't really know what went into it, or what they're supposed to do after it. So this is the concept that we're talking about is whole living, designing, building, and living green. So um, Laura is a designer, so she works with our clients to furnish, to, well she actually does selections for our client, we're going to talk about that in a little bit, um, a little bit more, but she also furnishes a lot of our homes, and so that is the main premise of what we're talking about today because that's really kind of that missing component, but we're going to talk about the whole building process, we're going to talk about selections and specifications. So because we're already selling furniture, we had to go find vendors that produce furniture that does an off-gas that's healthy. So um, we have decided to go ahead and make it public, uh, launch it to the public, and specifically to green builders, designers, realtors, and architects. So that's really what the store's about. So anybody will be able to buy there, but we want everybody to understand that once you build a green home, there's more to it. So that's just a little bit why we're doing the store. Um, I was president of Asheville HBA in 2008. Worked with those guys for a lot of years, and I went and worked with the North Carolina HBA. Um, and then I work with NHB a lot now. Been a green builder member since, I think, the very first year they opened. And I built one of the first certified homes. In fact, it's still on the brochure that they use. I love that they've not changed it. Um, but we love the Green Building Council and the Green Building Program. And there's other programs out there, but this is still our favorite, so this is the one we use. I love the Green Building Checklist. Um, I've been building about 25 years. You want to tell us a little bit about you? Sure. Um, I'm a native of the Asheville area, which is kind of a lot heard of these days. Mm -hmm. But my background is in interior design. Um, after design school, I pursued my contractor's licensure and my real estate licensure. So considering everything home, as well as all the other components, especially living in your home, is where my background is. Focusing now on interior design, we not only you know obviously work to make it beautiful, but also a place that is safe, comfortable, healthy, and fulfilling in many ways. Um, so now I've opened Ideology Interior Design in 2012. So we're now in our seventh year of business and uh, partnering with Livingstone to really bring our clients into understanding more about healthy living and healthy products because a lot of people really just don't know what, what they're exposed to. All right, so um, I found it most helpful, and um, as a student taking classes, I find that I learn as much from the classroom as I do from the instructor, the instructor in the curriculum. And so if we could just take a few minutes, go around the room, and just give us your name, what you do, I'm a, I'm a builder, I'm an architect, I'm an engineer, whatever it is you do, you may be retired, that's fine. But have you ever built or furnished a home before? Because that's going to help us understand who's in the audience and so we'll know kind of how to explain things. So let's start right up here. Um, I'm Rick Bayless with A Healthier Home. What I do, uh, my job is to, I'm an indoor environmental and health investigator. So uh, my job is to come and look at what happens next. Uh, what well, things might be going to miss on the health of the in houses. And have I ever built, furnished, or um, a home before? No, but I see a lot that are being built or have been built yep. even an hour or a century ago. Good. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Kat. I am an apprentice with a local contractor called Hume, and I'm a construction management student at Utech. Tech. And I have not built a home yet. Yet. <laughs> I'm Talia. 
Um, I didn't care what that seat. <laughs> um, I am a retail associate for a plant store in Nashville, Tennessee, and I have never built or furnished a home before. My name is Betsy Luttrell. Um, we actually both came here from Nashville today. Nashville. Wow. Just to be, yeah, because you're right. You guys are crushing it here, and we do a lot of it there. <laughs> um, so I'm an architect and a realtor. And my husband and I have a fledgling design build business, like three months old. So just getting in Good. And, and it's Nashville, right? So um, we're part of a, uh, a Wellness Within Your Walls program that um, has got nine test projects around the country. We're doing one of them here, but the first one was in Nashville by Castle Builders. Okay. Do you know them by chance? Uh, yeah, I've heard of them. And just, they're not quite there with the technology, so they kind of struggled with the process and building the home. Yeah. And getting the materials and the subs that understood all that. Right. So, but it is kind of moving that way, so that's yeah. great that you can here, so welcome. Hi, I'm Elaine Smith, and I'm a realtor. And I have built four homes, but they were just track homes. And I hope to build a green home in the next year. And um, that's it. Good. Mm -hmm. Paris Dobson, architect. I built very many sustainable and green homes. Great, we're glad you're here, Alice. And yeah. you came with a client. Uh, my name's Ross Cody. I'm retired. I used to go to work on this. Uh, never built a house before. I met a woman that furnishes hundreds of houses. So she's an interior designer. Good. Awesome. Good to you. My name's Erica Rand, and uh, I've renovated 10 projects, 10 houses. <coughs> Houses or apartments, and I have multiple chemical sensitivities. So I'm very interested in. I've researched, studied for many years uh, how to build a healthy house. It's not so easy, and I am in the process of building a house now, using what knowledge I have to try and make it as healthy as possible, as non-toxic as possible, yes. not. Non-toxic non is an important term. Yeah. Yeah, glad you're here. I'm Adrian Weir. I um, work for a local general contractor, commercial general contractor, and administrative support to the project managers and, and superintendents. And I'm a graduate of the CMT program at AU Tech. Also, um, by built. So we've had built a uh, home in El Salvador, where the, the key is the open envelope. You do not have closed envelopes there, and it's real different in terms of what you're looking at in terms of the health and comfort. Um, I've worked for Habitat and built lots of Habitat houses, and I've renovated any place I've ever owned because <laughs> I was like, oh, I want to do this and this and this. I currently bit, built a, a bought a fixer upper that has all sorts of interesting things about it that need to be remedied. So, um, the studying this as part of, okay, I'm looking, starting with the actual land that it's on and going into the plumbing and the, what the water does and going through the whole house. I'm looking at all these details before I actually start doing anything on it. Um, and I used to be a, a lead paint safety trainer for contractors in terms of doing renovations and stuff when there's lead paint present, which that eventually morphed into something called the Healthy Homes Initiative, which had a lot to do with indoor air quality and that sort of thing, and all the good things that could be present in existing buildings and other buildings. So, Cynthia Turner, I'm an uh, architect here in town, and I lead AP, B, B, and C, blah, blah, blah. And um, I decided I would take this class as part of my reading accreditation. Uh, I do specify um, low uh, interior environment quality uh, related issues for lead credits, uh, but I don't do residential. But people breathe and live inside of commercial buildings the same way they do in their homes. Mm -hmm. Great. Glad you're here. All right. Let's, uh, let's go back here. 
Right here? Sure. <laughs> Jonathan Gott. I'm a building science consultant and licensed North Carolina home inspector. And I help manage uh, low income weatherization programs through uh, Greenbelt Alliance called the Blue Horizons Project. Yeah. Energy Service Network. All around house nerd. Good. <laughs> I'm John Berti, I'm a builder for 30 years and uh, done a lot of green buildings and early on had quite a few clients who were chemically sensitive so got early on into figuring out how to build houses with good indoor air quality. It was harder to do that because there weren't the products yeah. being found. So. That's right. I mean, Nate Webster, I'm an architect with uh, Architect Design. We mostly do commercial stuff, but we do some residential and I've uh, been involved on in the construction and design side of uh, numerous uh, houses. Good. Yeah, and this will apply to any type of construction, just so you know. I'm Riley. I work with the Green Book Alliance and Energy Savers Network, and I have a background in residential construction. Good. I'll get you in the corner. I know. I know uh, Jessica Airwood. I'm a home energy grader. So I work with Livingstone as their kind of energy consultant along with hundreds of other green builders in Western North Carolina. And we do their Energy Star certifications, green build certifications, indoor air, indoor air plus. We work with all the affordable housing in Western North Carolina to do their certifications. So we are busy. <laughs> they are, and they're amazing how they stay. They keep up with the volume. Yeah, I think I just inspected your like 96th house with us. Wow. wow. So. <laughs> just because amazing. I mean, she's like on top of it. She's always waiting for the HVAC guy, usually, or somebody else to send them the paperwork that they're really good about mm -hmm. and all those certifications. But Indoor Air Plus is something we're very grateful they're able to do for us. Mm -hmm. So Jessica's a good person to have in the class. Thank you. Yep. And I'm Sam Argistas, director of Greenbelt Alliance. and. I have never built a house, but have consulted on many building projects, and I've renovated my own personal house, and of course, furnished my house, all bed, and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Julia Schaefer, and I'm Operations Coordinator for Energy Savers Network. Um, we're a program of Greenville Alliance, and uh, we help uh, lower income folks in Bunkin County. Uh, we provide free energy efficiency upgrades. And uh, I also received my master's in sustainability from actually this place, Lenora University. And um, back in the day, about 10 years ago, I uh, studied architecture in Baku, Azerbaijan. And, but I didn't complete this degree because I moved to the States. Uh, so I'm slowly getting back into building science and um, I'm excited to further my knowledge. And also I know uh, working just you know, in this community uh, how big of a problem uh, air quality is, so I look forward to them all. Hey, my name is Sophie Molinax. I'm the coordinator of the Blue Horizons Project, which is a program of the Green Belt Alliance that serves to connect everyone in Buckley County with energy efficiency resources, um, businesses and homes, um, no matter what their income level. Um, I live in a Green Belt house. I have a young daughter, so I'm very concerned with indoor air quality. <coughs> Um, I recently had an experience maybe like six years ago where I bought a sofa and had to return it because I was I found out I was allergic to it. So maybe there was formaldehyde or something in it, but I don't find myself to be a particularly chemically sensitive person, so that was a surprising experience that sort of opened my eyes to like what we put in our furniture and our bedding and, um, and our building materials. So excited to learn more. I'm Hannah Egan. I'm the out outreach and resource coordinator for Greenville Alliance and Energy Savers Network, and I help with the low income um, weatherization program as well. Um, I've never built a house. My house is furnished, but nothing well thought out or purposely selected at all. <laughs> That's where I can get, kind of. That's like most of us. Yeah. <laughs> that style has a name. It's called early miscellaneous. <laughs> 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 Take it. And I'm Carrie Barkas. I'm the Community Engagement Director at Greenbelt Alliance. Um, 
I uh, help with a variety of things at Greenville, including some event planning and marketing communications, membership, that sort of thing. So we'd love to have more of you involved in member as members if you aren't already. Um, I've never built a home, but I'm always in awe of all the amazing. We have almost 300 members doing this work in the community, so it's really cool. I feel like by osmosis, I pick up some little knowledge here and there, but I'm always glad to learn more. Um, and just one thing I forgot to mention in the intro, hearing that there are a bunch of architects in the crowd with us today, um, this course is eligible for AIA continuing education credit, so just make sure to sign the sign-in sheet on the back table here before you leave today um, to get those. So. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. <clears throat> All right, so we've already talked a lot about this already, but just when you think about green building, and it's so funny because the answers we'll get in this room are totally different than what we got in Charlotte and what we'll get in uh, New Orleans next week on the road. What does a green building mean to you? <laughs> just say it out loud. Non toxic. Non toxic. Good. Energy efficiency. Energy efficiency. Building performance. Low carbon, low carbon. Good. Yep. Low carbon footprint. Um, I mean, it's a holistic building that doesn't just um, reduces the carbon, but maybe it gives back to. Like, That's a great description. Holistic building. Great. So those are a little bit different answers than I got last month by Cardi Plank. Right. So you guys are already there, okay? We're just going to hone in just a little bit and try to create a little bit of awareness. Alright, so green building is not a new concept to most of us. After all, it has been around since the beginning of time. I mean, think about it. Think about how we build today and think about how maybe they built 2,000 years ago. You just use what you've got in nature, right? So, however, as our new home envelopes have gotten tighter, we are in danger of poisoning the inhabitants with toxins and poor indoor air quality, IAQ. This course expounds on the importance of designing, building, and living in a good indoor air environment. All right, so our objectives today are to introduce you to the concept of whole living, to explore and identify the pollutants that contribute to poor indoor air quality during the construction process, to identify the construction practices that reduce particulates and to increase indoor air quality, and to recognize the dangers that selections and furnishings can present to the home. And then ultimately, hopefully, you walk out of here with um, some real solutions to furnishing the new home. Okay, so it's all those things. It's designing, it's the building, and it's the furnishing, which is the living in it. There's some behavioral strategies that tie into that that we'll talk about. <coughs> there are a lot of misconceptions about the meaning of building and living green. One of the biggest is about the word natural. Many believe that this word means that a product is safe to use or eat, but this isn't always the case. Some products are naturally occurring but are highly toxic. For example, radon, lead, mold, and poison ivy. <laughs> but <-umpa. laughs> It's like funny, we've got a lot of people who are saying, you know, it's natural, it's good, it's natural, it's good, but not always the case. Our son came home with a rash on his legs and it was really poison ivy, so. <laughs> it kind of ties into that. So the whole living concept, this is what we are here about, is to learn not just about sustainability um, and how we can you know, be great stewards of the environment, but also ourselves in connection with that. Whole living is the philosophy of intentionally designing, building, furnishing, and living in an environment that is mindful of one's health in their home or another space. So while a crucial component of being green is the sustainable use of resources and having a low environmental impact, another piece of the green puzzle is the impact install products have on the health of the residents. And in a country where we statistically spend 90% of our time indoors, it's concerning that EPA has found that indoor environments are typically two to five times more toxic than the outdoor air. So what's causing this? Um, volatile organic compounds, VOCs. You know, probably the majority of us here know what VOCs are, and also formaldehydes and things like that that go into products that we a lot of times don't know unless we're educated about them. I'm just going to go back to that. So products, it's not just <coughs> the product itself 
that has the potential to have chemicals or other things infused to it. But sometimes it depends on how it's made, how it's treated. Um, plywoods have glues that are used to actually make the plywood. Um, finishes that are applied to products, flooring and things like that. And so we gotta think about not just what it is, but what happens to it before it comes into the company. So another reason is the way the older buildings were built, they were built without this concept of energy efficiency. That wasn't something that builders thought about years ago. And they actually intentionally wanted some natural ventilation coming through. So over time, with allergies, seasonal allergies and things like that, and then also energy efficiency, a lot of individuals have tightened up the building process, designed tighter homes in order to, to amp up energy efficiency, which is incredibly important. But um, now with the newer builds, they're trapping these things in your air, and you, you don't always smell them. Sometimes it could be a physical reaction besides just you know, knowing that it's there. All right, energy efficient homes with tight envelopes, these toxic vapors remain in the home or, and are absorbed into furnishings and finishes, and they unknowingly cause health problems. And it's not just, you, know, you think, maybe sometimes if I eat something, I have digestive upset. Or if I smell something, I have respiratory upset. But really, you can have symptoms that are not automatically associated with what or how you ingested or were exposed to something. So um, there are you know, kind of what we call unknown killers that are present. Um, another thing too is I think it's statistically proven that off-gassing happens for up to about, seven, maybe not up to, it could be more, but on average seven years. So some products. Some products, okay. Yeah. The majority of off-gassing is done within a couple weeks. The new stuff that comes in. Um, so when we build a new home, we actually tell the client there's a month that we're going to take, and so it's kind of hold them, hard to hold them off for a month. But we want to do those final inspections. We get Jessica to come in and do her testing. We are um, we're doing um, punch list stuff. We're testing appliances. We're opening windows. We're turning on ceiling fans. We're running exhaust hoods and bathroom fans. We're doing everything we can to off gas that house before we hand it over to the client. So a couple weeks is good in that regard, but there's other products like liquid mail that will have pop gas up to seven years. You may have no idea if you built a home that your builder took liquid mail and squirted on top of that floor truss and then put the plywood down on top of it, and then you're breathing it. So everything's got a different off gas lifespan, but certain products are longer than others for sure. And although we specify healthy, non-toxic, or low VOC products, there still are you know, low levels of some toxins that are naturally occurring, like formaldehyde is a natural occurring element, and as well as radon and things like that that can get trapped. So it's, it's out there. We cannot totally eliminate it, but sometimes we've had clients who like, well, you're a green builder and a green designer. Why do we have to off-gas? Well, because it's, it's still there. It's just we're trying to limit the amount that we bring into the home. So, dangerous pollutants. Why are we facing toxic indoor environments today? Over the years, through the building code and incentive programs like Energy Star, we've increased the air tightness of our buildings to increase the energy efficiency. Well, that's good, right? We want to decrease our um, our utility costs. We want to increase the efficiency of the house. Everything that you put into your house when you're building it is going to be for the life of the house, right? So the better you make it to begin with, each year it's going to pay itself back. We're thinking, you know, 50, 100 years these homes could be. So it's worth the uh, investment up front to get that house as tight as possible. But then we've got to look at the flip side of that. The danger, of course, is that because we are building tighter envelopes, we are breathing more of what goes in our home. And because we are buying cheap products, we are surrounding ourselves, ourselves with harmful, off-gassing products in a tight box. So this was a great um, diagram that we found. And um, let's just talk for a second about the different types of um, ceiling for just a quick second. 
there's different ways that you can seal up your house, okay, or your builder. Um, assuming that there's not very many, or not assuming, but seeing that there's not that many builders in here. If you hire a builder, there's different ways that they can seal up your house. You know, first thing is, you're going to be on top of whatever conditions are below grade. So as long as that soil has uh, got a compaction rate that's suitable, you're building on top of it. And in which case we can't find in the mountains a uh, compaction rate that's suitable, we have to take that out and we have to fill it. Typically it's with gravel. So we're setting the house on gravel or we're setting on some type of substrate. Anything could be coming up from underneath there. So we need that vapor barrier. That vapor barrier is going to help protect air leakage from coming up. That's one of the first things that we can do. The next thing that we can do is seal up the wall so we don't have water coming in. Right? Water, believe it or not, can affect your indoor air environment because that's going to contribute to mold, right? Lots of other things. Now, when we do Energy Star, um, Jessica would be looking at your house on each plane. So the wall plane, the floor plane, the roof plane. We foam our roof, so we do an open cell foam on the roof, and when we do that, Jessica then looks at it as an envelope, just like licking that envelope and sealing it. So now it's all sealed up. So we can still use fiberglass, high compression fiberglass pads on the walls if it's installed correctly, and then foam the roofs. Now everything is inside of this box. So what are we breathing when we have that situation? So gases we talked about, like radon, coming up from the ground. Um, but it could be worse than that. There could be a spill down the street and that those uh, chemicals wick their way into the water system and they end up coming up and you could breathe them. Chemical fumes from paints and solvents. So those are products that we can control and we're going to talk about today. Combustion gases from fireplaces and wood-burning stoves. Have you thought about that? All of our clients, what? We're talking about fireplaces. We want to burn wood. Well, yes, it is fun to burn wood. Well, let's do that in the fire pit outside. <laughs> Burning wood inside the house is not great for lots of reasons. Jessica's not going to like it because it's not going to seal the house up. It's like building this really nice envelope and you seal it and then you stick your finger right through it and there's a big hole in it. That's what happens with a wood burning fireplace. So you've got to put glass doors on there if you're going to do that. It just kind of defeats the purpose. But um, burning, combustion, um, gas ranges and ovens, those are all off-gassing in the house, so you want to limit those. Chemicals released from modern building and furnishing materials, Laura mentioned a couple of those, plywoods are a good one. Um, cabinets and shelving are two of the worst polluters in any house. So the, those outside of furnishings are the ones that we want to spend a few minutes talking about today. Outdoor air pollutants, so if your house is not, if the builder's not paid attention to the envelope and it's not controlled, you could be pulling in outside air that's unwanted. So we've got to pay attention to how the house is going to breathe. Mold and bacteria, we talked a little bit about that, but um, even just thinking about what's on your shoes and then you walk across your threshold, and our son walks right across the dining room rug, and he's been outside playing in the mud, and I'm like, oh my gosh, what's on that? Can we take those off and leave them at the door? You're bringing in mold and bacteria. Chemicals from cleaning products, that is a big one. People really don't think about that. You think about cleaning, that's safe, right? Because it's a cleaning product. Actually, those are some of the strongest chemicals in the house. So I want to talk about what we do with those, what we use, and then how we store those. Cigarette smoke, that's kind of a no-brainer, e-vape or vaping, um, but those are filled with chemicals, and so we don't want those trapped inside the house where people are breathing that secondary smoke. Animal hair and dander, a lot of us have pets, mm -hmm. but that contributes to poor indoor air quality, so how do you take care of that? And then carbon monoxide fumes, um, we're gonna address how to deal with that, and potentials for re residual carbon monoxide fumes. All right, so what can happen? Sick building syndrome. Everybody heard of this? Mm -hmm. The term sick building syndrome is used to describe situations in which building occupants experience acute health and comfort effects <laughs> that appear to be linked to time spent in the building, but no specific illness or cause can be identified. Mm -hmm. 
it's hard to nail down what it is that's affecting the person. It might even be hard to identify what their symptoms are. <coughs> the complaints can be localized to a particular room or zone, or may be widespread throughout the building. In contrast, the term building-related illness is used when symptoms of diagnosable illnesses are identified and can be attributed directly to airborne building contaminants. We, um, we just had a magazine published last week and we hand them out at our parade homes. Um, and the guy came to deliver them and deliver the box right in our foyer. And every time I go in and out the door, I mean, it's terrible. I think about the people that were printing those and they're sitting there smelling that stuff all day long. I really want to storm outside, but I know the moisture would kill them. So we're just, we've got them right by the door, <laughs> fanning it. But that's what we're talking about. If you can smell it, you know it's not good for you. But there's also products that you maybe don't smell or you, you've gotten used to. That new car smell, we all like that because it's a new car, but that's really not good. Those are the EOCs. All right, so this is, um, this is a true story. We built this house, um, beautiful home, great clients, and it's Energy Star certified, it's green built, um, but the homeowner insisted on using IKEA cabinets. This is not a dig at all to IKEA. That's where my what, couch was from that I had to return. But from what I understand, IKEA doesn't use formaldehyde in their products worldwide, just in the U.S. because we allow them. Oh, no. Except that. Yeah, and the furniture had to be sprayed with paint, 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 So, anyways, we, she says, I want to use the IKEA cabinets because I can get them for half the price of what your cabinet book is. Tried to talk her out of it. I explained her the pros and the cons. She insisted, so she ordered the. I said, okay, well, this will be your thing. You bring them in and you get them installed and all that. So the IKEA cabinets come and they come in boxes, and the boxes are all that tall. And they get delivered to her garage, and she looks at me and she goes, "What am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> what do you want to do with it?" She goes, "Well, I thought they were going to be assembled. So the reason why they're less expensive is because there's sweat equity involved." Mm -hmm. So she goes, well, I can't put these together. I said, well, no, I didn't suspect that you could. So let's get our trim carpenter to put together a price. So he put together a price to put together all of her cabinets out of a box. And of course, you know, you've got all the little pegs and the little circles. Half of them are missing. So he gets the cabinets together. He calls them up. He's like, Sean, I don't even think these are going to hang. He said, I mean, they're ripping out, you know, when you pick them up. So he got them all to work. He got cleats on the wall. <coughs> And you know they finished okay. Um, true story, and I can't prove anything. But two years or three years into living there, she developed cancer. Oh my God. Yep. Oh and she came through it, and I think she's still in remission. But it's a true story. It's terrible, but it was like wow. We've never heard of any of our clients ever getting cancer after moving into the house. This is the one that. They insisted on using these cabinets that were extremely toxic smelling. Um, and so, anyways, that's a great example that I can give that was a real life experience. We obviously don't know how she got cancer. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to take a minute to expand on that story. Uh, my builder used IKEA cabinets, and I wanted to do some cardboard for um, ground cover to, to get rid of the invasives. <laughs> and they gave me some cardboard and it's in my garage and I'm going to take it out of my garage <laughs> because I go in the garage it's been waiting you know, to be used I can smell the cardboard mm -hmm. and that there I, it's from Ikea? Yeah. from Ikea yeah. Yeah. yeah but Thank you. That, that is an example of cabinetry and shelving in general that off gases. And so the less expensive the product, it seems there's more glue. There's more um, formaldehyde. And so it's to preserve. It's basically particle board that's holding it all together. And so the more expensive is the more solid woods, right? Mm -hmm. so unfortunately, that's just the way it works. But even when you're putting together solid wood, we have to look at the materials that we're using for adhesives to do that and the materials that we're finishing it with. 
and then the materials that we're upholstering it with. There's three um, potential targets when you're looking at something like a, uh, an upholstered case good, um, or in this case, cabinets. So cabinets are really the biggest polluters. I was talking to Sam about this earlier. Cabinets was the first one that we handled, and I'll show you how we handled that. The second one was closet shelving, and then we figured out how to handle that. And then the third and toughest one was interior doors. Mm. So um, doors are held together with glue. Mm. Yeah, and so if they're paint gray, they're a lot of glue because it's masonite and it's pressed. Mm -hmm. So we had to find a product that was um, a low VOC uh, solid core door. All right, so to expound on that, some main sources of VOCs. When it comes to the indoors, there are many items that emit volatile organic compounds, including, um, and we're going to go through some of these when we talk about the selections and specifications process. A lot of these are kind of obvious, but some of them, hmm, I didn't really think about that. Paints and stains, those are probably the most obvious, right? Because everyone can smell when the painter's done there especially if it's all stained wood, right? We're building a house right now, and I think there's wood on every single surface in this lady's house. Everywhere she's got wood. And so um, we have specified low VOC, uh, we actually specified donut, and the painter couldn't get that in time, so he wanted to use min wax, because that was the color that was approved, so we specified a low VOC um, min wax. And we go over there, and the superintendent calls me and says, or he calls the painter and says, your guys aren't using low VOC. And sure enough, he picked up the can and they weren't. So they're getting ready to coat all the wood in this lady's house with high VOC material. So you've got to pay attention to paints and stains. And that's really easy to do now for picking it out. You just have to make sure that that's the product that they actually get. Varnishes are just toxic in general. Waxes, that might be something that they put on top of the surface as a finish, which you might not have known or even thought about. Glues and adhesives, we've talked a little bit about that, but they are in everything. So you think about, you know, you come and you're walking around your house that's being framed, and you don't even realize that you're stepping on a plywood that's glued down with that liquid nail that we were talking about earlier, or maybe even your hardwood floors were glued down. So we actually glue hardwood floors to slabs. So our lower level will get an engineered wood floor and we'll glue it. So what's that product that they're using? And you gotta realize you're making the decision, you're giving it to your builder, your builder is hiring a subcontractor who's maybe even subbing it out to somebody else who's hiring an employee who's getting eight dollars an hour. They don't care what they're using, this is the product they've always used. They're probably not most likely not looking at what you spent. So there's due diligence in this, and you want to find somebody who you're confident in, and you have to take some of this up on yourself to make sure that these products are actually going to be used. Uh, can you take a question? Yes, sir. So like in the case of your company, that linkage of that communication over five or six people you just described, how do you all, or what's a method to assure the quality of that? Great how's question. It, how's it get from A to yeah. So we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. That's a great question because that's that's really one of the missing components. And it's very often overlooked. One thing I will tell you is Jessica, she asked for verification on everything. So you have to provide all of the data sheets, MSDS sheets, you got to provide labels, all the things that you've used in your house, you're going to get credit. So that's a good incentive. Pesticides. Think about that. If you're spraying things in your house to kill bugs, probably not good to breathe. Um, I would say Terminex has a green option, so if you're treating pests in your home, Terminex, I'm sure the others do too, have a green option. So just tell me what the green option. It's not as toxic and it doesn't kill all the bugs. Sometimes they have to come back, but the point is if they're just spraying their normal product, that's not a good product to be squirting inside of your home where you've got kids crawling around, you may have pets, you drop food on the kitchen floor and you pick it up and rinse it off. I mean, you got to think about all these variables. Building materials, we're going to talk about that. Drywall, vinyl flooring is one of the worst things that you can put in. And guess what? It's one of the most affordable, right? 
We just talked about that. Unfortunately, the less expensive products have the worst chemicals in them. Carpeting, I think all of us probably realize that carpet is not a great choice. Carpeting in general is a toxic um, product. And also for behavioral strategies, when you've walked into your, your uh, across your threshold, whatever's on the bottom of your shoes is getting trapped in your carpet. So then that's festering too. Um, and then plastics, we'll talk a little bit about that. All right, so when we're building a home and we're designing a home, when we're designing a building and then uh, moving a client into it, there's a process for making selections. So we have to identify what's a selection and what's a specification. We use a software system that really helps us with this. It's called Co-Construct. I think we were the first builder in Nashville to use it. Probably 50 builders in Nashville are using it now. But what's nice about it is that it splits up the components of the home and who is responsible for picking them out and the selection process for doing that. So we've identified what is a specification and what is a selection. So when um, Livingstone builds a house, Livingstone's got a superintendent, that superintendent works with Jessica to um, order all the specifications. So those are the sticks and bricks, the two by fours, um, the plywoods, the things that you as the homeowner really don't, wouldn't think about and probably don't even care about. The things that just frame the house, the skin, okay? The selections are the things that you do care about. Those are the pretty things. Those are the fun things to pick out. Those are the things that cost a lot of money and blow your budget. <clears throat> selections are things that you would pick out as an owner or a designer. So some of these things um, for a selection would include paint, stains, flooring, appliances, fixtures, and furnishings. Anybody can pick them out, but it's nice when you can identify who's responsible. All right, specifications that should be considered in relation to IAQ. We've mentioned this, but let's talk about it a little bit more. Adhesive, sealant, mortar, grout, and caulk. Who would have thought that the grout that your tile setter is putting in between the tiles could be toxic? But it's an adhesive. So adhesives have solvents in them, they have chemicals in them. So you've got to think about what that is. And you can actually specify now when you pick out your tile for a low VOC grout. And although Laura's team at Ideology specifies the tile and the grout, I'm hiring the tile installer and he is supplying his own setting materials. You guys know what setting materials are? Setting material is something that the trade's going to supply and he's going to put in your shower floor and he's going to slope and he's going to put in that mud pack. He's going to put in the vinyl pan. He'll um, sometimes provide the trap in the shower. He will provide the niches and he will provide the grout. He has to get the grout color from the designer or the selections team, but he's providing those things. I talked about gluing down wood floors. Um, we talked about gluing down subfloors. Um, in Energy Star, we, we will caulk the bottom plate to seal it down. So what is that product that you're caulking? You have to think about each of those little tubes that come on site, okay? Plumbing equipment. Um, you wouldn't think about plumbing being <coughs> toxic, but if you've ever walked on a job site while a plumber is installing pipe, you smell that pipe cleaner, that purple stuff, that is toxic. So there are actually aspects of plumbing that you need to consider. Hex piping is pretty common here, and Hex is great for this environment. We're in a region four mixed humid, and so stuff moves. It moves a lot. I tell my clients up front, you can expect things to move. So here, PEX works great because it'll expand and contract. Those water lines won't snap, like um, sometimes they will copper pop. Um, but you do want to pay some attention. There was, um, I was telling Sam this earlier too, there was some bad PVC that was on the market in the late 80s and early 90s, and we've taken it out of some homes that we've remodeled. It was purple. I've lost the name of it right now, but if you've remodeled homes, you may have seen that. That was toxic. 
insulation. So insulation, insulation should meet the insulation, insulation Q2 standards. What does that mean? There's a certain way that you should put an insulation that is going to seal up the house and give you maximum energy efficiency. And that's another thing that Jessica and her team at Vandermust are do for us. Um, making sure that your insulation is installed right and then also making sure that you've got the right product. So you want to use products that meet or exceed California section 1350 for VOC emissions. You'll see that repeated a lot through this uh, presentation. California leads the way, that's no surprise, California leads the way to good indoor air quality and high standards and so they write a lot of specifications that the rest of the country later adopts. You can install insulation with zero VOCs like wool and natural cotton. We're building a home for um, a woman right now that's actually our test project in Olivet, and it's going to be, um, it's going to have 100% natural uh, insulation, so we're using wool everywhere. May I ask a question? Yes. Uh, but what do you use to make it uh, fire retardant or um, wool? So all or wool is actually, yeah. Go ahead. Wool is naturally fire resistant. Okay. So yeah. what would be in case of using denim that would not be considered um, zero VOC? Denim? Yeah. I'm not sure. Do you know Jessica? Like, I would think it would depend on the dyeing process. Yeah. What is dyeing? Because, I mean, it's cotton originally, um, so I don't think it would depend on the dyeing process. Yeah, so, so like... So what would VOC? <laughs> We've not used that before, but I would imagine that that would be a concern. Rock wool is what we use around all our combustibles. Great question. Which leads right into fireplaces and appliances. So all fireplaces should be direct vent and have fixed glass doors. So really they should be sealed. You shouldn't be able to open them. And you want that flue to be able to go straight up with as, less, as few turns as possible. And you want that thing to draw well. If you're building an Energy Star home, We've, there's one house that comes to mind. It was a French country that was built out in Cane Creek. Beautiful house. They, and it was a big house, and they wanted this big with a burning fireplace. And their home was just about meant to do it. And I said, you're going to have problems with it. And they said, we don't care. This is the one thing we want. We want a wood burning fireplace. So you're not going to be able to light it. It's just not going to work well. And sure enough, every time they light that thing, it you know, backdrafts, and they have to open doors. And so if you're opening doors, What's the point of having a fire, right? You might as well have a fire pit outside. Then you backdraft it, so now all that smoke and combustion gas is in your house. So you've got a pressurization that you're creating when you're sealing that envelope. So if you have a sealed direct vent fireplace, you're taking care of that, and it'll be super uh, responsive to heat. It'll really teach your house quick. Good question. When you have a wood stove and you're, you have the pipe going out through the chimney, do you want to insulate around that pipe and the chimney? What do you use in that condition? Rock wool. Okay. Yep, yeah, rock wool is perfect. Yeah. And so those are good because you can seal up those, you know, wood stoves. And we've heated wood stoves before. You can seal them up. But just in, in thought of any type of combustion just is not good to have coming inside. So you just want to try and keep that control. <clears throat> you had mentioned you want, you want that pipe going straight out. But one of the things that we look for as well is fresh air intake. With the houses being so airtight in the way that fire works and it needs oxygen to burn, what it does is it actually tries to suck air from the outside through all the holes in your house. But when your house is really airtight, then it ends up not burning well, like you said. And so having something called a fresh air intake where it's pulling directly from the outside and not through your house um, allows the fire to, to burn a lot better. Yeah, we have to do that with hood ranges that are over 600 CFM. But even in this, this house out in King Creek that we had the problem with, we had two fresh airs coming in. It still could be that in the light draw. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the tighter you build, the harder it's going to be to do that inside. So you just want to be aware of these things. And then if it is backdrafting again, you know, you're creating a polluted environment inside your home. And aside from the smoke of the pews, that you can clean out and then it's particulates that get thrown up into the air and it's not just that. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. All right.
right, so that kind of segues into envelope air tightness. Um, you want to seal all cavities to maintain a tight building envelope and to eliminate the transfer of contaminants. So like Jessica was just talking about, you know, if, if you don't have equalized pressure in your home, you're going to be pulling in air. And if you're pulling in air, you're not controlling that. So you could be pulling it in from anywhere. So I think about like when I was a kid and I would close a door, you know, in a, in a house and then you'd hear another door somewhere else in the house close. That's because, you know, you don't have that balance and it's sucking air in. It could be coming in from the crawl space underneath your sill plate here. It could be coming in from your top plate. So Energy Star has specific um, uh, directions on how to seal all of these things up. Um, you could be pulling air in from your attic. Um, right here where you've got a drop soffit so you could have attic air that's down in there that's now coming into a, a bedroom or bathroom. You've got penetrations through the wall, like um, dryer vent. Um, if you ever look at after your rough ends are done, your electrician and your plumber and your HVAC and your gas guy will all do a really good job of making penetrations in your house. So you want to go back and seal all those up for lots of reasons, right? Not just air quality, but air tightness and bugs and all that stuff. So we often think about the energy component of this, but we're not thinking about the indoor air quality component. So that segues into ventilation. So one thing that, um, that we do, obviously you want bath fans mm -hmm. in your home and in all moisture areas. We actually put them inside the shower and then we put them above the toilet. So we typically have two per bathroom. But you can, um, there's a great product called Whisper Green, which is uh, made by Panasonic. And years and years and years ago, we found them at the International Builder Show. And we brought them back here and asked our electricians to start using them. And they have, and now I think a lot of people are using them. The Whisper Green fan is fantastic. It comes with modules where you can put sensors in there. So one of them is a humidity sensor which is great. So that'll just take care of any concerns that you have with roommates or kids or guests or whatever. Put that humidity sensor on your Whisper Green fan. As a standard, we wrote into our specifications that we're going to have an exhaust fan on a motion sensor in our garage. So every home has that, which is nice. And so what happens is when you pull into your garage and you park and your garage doors come down, that fan kicks on and it will exhaust out those fumes for 15 minutes. You can also have that fan on a separate switch. We put that switch higher on the wall so it's above the other switches so people don't think to hit it and turn it off. But if you are working out there in a workshop or whatever, you could flip that fan off. But you know that it's up here and it's not um, one of your normal switches that you might have flipped off. Do you have a specific name for that? Is there a name for that? That's a whisper green as well. Oh, it is? Yeah, okay. and then we just put it on a motion sensor. Motion. Yeah. And the most important thing you can do for your house, um, beyond those things, is an energy recovery ventilation system, an ERD. Some parts of the country have HRDs, heat recovery ventilation. In Asheville, in the region 4 mixed humid, the ERD works the best. And this is something that's um, it's about $1,800 or $1,900 add-on to your HVAC package, but it controls the air um, that comes in your house. So it'll filter it, and it produces fresh, fresh air into your system. Um, every once in a while, I have a client that doesn't want to spend the money on it, and there is an alternative way that you can do it. We can put a whisper green in the central bathroom, and we can have that thing on a timer where it runs X number of minutes per hour. So Jessica and her folks help us figure out what's the best way to do that. But 99% of our homes have an ERV. We just figure that into the estimate to begin with. And the, the ERVs, they provide pressure, but they're also removing the stale air that's built up in your house at the same time. So it's a balance system. Good point. It filters the outside air and brings in the system. Um, one of the things I think on the checklist is adding a uh, fan to your mechanical room. So that is something that's optional, but you know, it's just one more thing that you can do to continue to improve your indoor air quality. And I have professed that any house that we live in going forward, and I'm now recommending it to my clients, in the kitchen, 
I'm now going to start specifying an exhaust fan in the ceiling, even though we have the hood of the range, because like we do high cook, high heat cooking, and every time there's stuff that escapes and just hangs out there in the ceiling, and you can't get it to go away. So I'm like, next time. Especially walls and ceiling. Yeah, a vaulted ceiling, people would like tall ceilings, really, where it, you know, it just goes up. So that is when we start doing it's not required, but anything to help. I have a better looking solution than that, I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. <laughs> yes. Can you add an ERV after our house is built? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we try to essentially locate like in a stairwell, so it'll get both floors. If it's a big house, you'd want to do two. You can retrofit it later, they just have to get the duct. They can access your unit, no problem, but they've got to get ductwork to the outside and the ductwork to the central location in your house. And there's varying degrees of ERVs you can get. But yes, it's it's really good when you think about, like, especially in the winter when we're closed in, right? Everybody's sick all the time, and you're not outside much. You don't have your windows and doors open. I'm really thankful to have my ERV, especially in the winter. Do you have a strong opinion on HRV versus ERV? Do you think it's human? So um, that's really pre preferred based on your ge geographic zone. So different parts of the country and the climate. But right where we are, the ERV is the most effective, but a little bit farther north, the northwest, I think, is the HRV. Yeah, good question. All right, duct leakage. This is a big one. Um, nobody's ever come in and said, Sean, I want you to build me a uncomfortable house. Right? We all want to build a comfortable house or be in a comfortable house. Now, who has lived in that house with cold zones, right? Where you feel that cold air blowing out? Well, usually, and this has changed a lot here. I don't know if it's changed much around the country, but HVAC contractors would be responsible for picking the unit, the tonnage, and they would always upsize it, right, Jessica? And so then your unit's too big for your house, so the thing runs too often, and it just is not efficient. One of the things that goes with that inefficient system is the duct work. So you have $8 an hour guys or whatever that aren't paying attention to the specifications or maybe haven't even gone through the training that their lead has or have the experience and they're just slapping together duct work and it's leaking all over like a sieve. So um, Jessica and her team will check the duct leakage by doing a duct blaster test, which is awesome. So if you can reduce the leakage you're going to increase the performance of your house, thereby also increasing the indoor air quality of your house. And then there's an ideal ratio not to exceed 6 CFM per 100 square feet of condition space. And they take care of all that, but that's why you want to hire a, a rater for you. Okay? Your rater will save you money the very first day they come on the job, I promise you. Amy or Jessica or anyone from our team will come on our job and they'll measure the insulation. And if we've specified seven inches of open cell foam and it's six and a half, they'll call out the insulator and they'll say, hey, get back over here and I'll add extra insulation. Now right there, save this money. Excuse me. Uh, that example you just gave six and a half inches versus seven or whatever it is, um, do you all have a methodology in the process versus after the fact in that example of the later that controls that? So how do you know that real time versus after the fact? That's what my question is. So you can't be in there during the process of spraying the foam. Mm -hmm. It's very toxic mm -hmm. while it's going in because you got particulates, right? So the only way to do that is to measure it after the fact. You want to tell them what you want? If you're just spraying code, they know what to do for that. Um, but we spray above code. But either way, you've got to measure it. So yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, and then pest control, we talked about that already, but like think about termites. They're coming in that, you may not realize this, but the, the typical system is they'll come and they'll spray your slab before they pour it. So all that stuff's going right under your house and you're breathing that. It's getting encased in concrete, but it's still gonna wick up like that diagram that we saw. Um, or it could, right, or it might overspray on something. We just try to keep all those chemicals out, so we'll do a bait system around the house afterwards. It's in the ground. So we're trying not to spray any chemicals on the house. Selections are the things that we all have a choice, well, more of a choice on. So like you said, you know, something really like that the building. Your builder has a choice, you have a choice, and specify to your builder 
you know, what you'd like to use in your home. But the selections are, like you said, the pretty things. Tile, paint, flooring, countertops, cabinetry, you know, the things that really appeal to your aesthetic. The first thing that really I think a lot of people think is, you know, these coatings that we know of, specifically paints and stains, really impact our health in such big ways that, you know, that they do have VOC emissions, and the majority of the paints on the market do. Um, there are products that are low VOC, there are products that are zero VOC. Um, and what you want to consider when looking for those is also characteristics in the coatings that could help inhibit mold growth, as well as um, mold, mildew, bacteria. There are some coatings out there that are antibacterial. And then there are some now, actually, one that I just found through Sherman Williams that actually absorbs some formaldehyde and VOCs. <coughs> So it takes, it takes them out of the air. Um, Harmony is one of those, and there's paint, um, Emerald as well, through Sharon Williams, but there are other, other paint manufacturers, and we were just talking about Romano Bio, which is more of a mineral-based, naturally flame-resistant, fire-resistant, and is naturally antibacterial, antimicrobial. Um, you know, a lot of times we'll have clients who really want the most durable, the most long-lasting products that are out on the market. And so one of the things that we have to do is go through educating our clients and saying, just because it's durable and long-lasting does not mean that it's the best thing for you. And so we have to educate them and say, these are the pros and cons. So one thing I do want to encourage you in in your search for different products, when you ask, is this green? Is it non-toxic? Don't always just take someone's word for it. Get the backup paperwork to go with it. You know, we've had different vendors that we work with over the years that we say, hey, we're looking for a healthy, non-toxic plywood in your cabinetry. And they're like, oh, yeah, it's healthy, it's non-toxic. Like, okay, give me the MSDS sheets. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, it is, it is. And I never get it, never get the sheets. I get the sheets, and then, you know, finally I'm like, well, if you can't provide it, then I can't trust what you're saying. So do check. Do check the background, but the MSDS sheets are what you want to ask for. I have a question. Yes. Do y'all have any specific resources you recommend yeah. for while we're doing our personal resource research mm -hmm. for a certain like, actual products to use? Well, there is um, is a company called Green Building Products. Green like, Building Supply. Supply. Yeah. Thank you. Green Building Supply. Yeah, and that's that's all they do. They're excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So you know, those are some things that you may want to order samples. Joe like that. Joe Hirschberg is too Yes. Uh, kind of tracking back a little bit to the ventilation, but really to this too. But is there? Do you guys have like a breaking period at the end of a construction project that you might run the ERVs uh, at full ventilation to kind of get some of those initial toxins out of the house? So um, uh, I mentioned that we spent about a month trying to ventilate the house. That is including normal use of the ERV, but turning on the exhaust fans, turning on the hood, turning um, on ceiling fans and opening windows. So we're, we're doing everything we can to ventilate that house for about a month. Of course, it's not always perfect, you know, and sometimes it's raining and sometimes it's not a month. Two weeks is ideal, if you, or two weeks is great. If you do more than that, that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And back to product resources, one thing that you really could do is check the Green Guard website because a lot of times you'll be able to find lists of products that are certified that then you can search and source at a supplier center. So that's a really, really great resource. All right, selections that should be considered in relation to IAQ cabinets and trim. We talked about this already. Um, cabinetry, the plywood is, is
primarily the most toxic part of cabinetry. You do need to consider the finishes that go on the cabinetry, the, the inside clear coat on the maple or whatever it is, um, and then the exterior coatings, paints or stains. So when you're looking at looking for plywood, pure bond plywood is what we usually look for ourselves. And that is a low DOC, no added formaldehyde plywood, and that's used for furniture or cabinetry, closet systems, things like that. So we do have a couple resources, furniture, excuse me, cabinetry resources that build cabinetry for us using the pure bond plywood, but there are others that um, or cabinet manufacturers that have those options. So a lot of times different brands will have the lower price option that's not using a pure bond or that it's not the no out of formaldehyde, but ask them what their options are for low VOC, no out of formaldehyde plywoods. So the plywoods are the biggest component. And then with the finishes, a lot of times they'll say the finishes aren't as durable like we mentioned, and sometimes they aren't. But that's just, you know, it's, you know, it's worth your health to have something that may not hold up just forever. But you can, you know, get the MSC sheets on those things. But if you're doing custom cabinetry, it's not always crazy expensive, um, custom cabinetry, you can specify the paints that you want to use. So we specify how many paints if we're doing painted cabinetry. Or we specify the low VOC minwax or something that's comparable for stains. It's just that when you do that, a lot of times the cabinetry, cabinetry companies will put a clear coat over top of those finishes, the paints are the stains. So you want to make sure you know what is on that clear coat as well. So they can say, yeah, we'll use that paint, we'll use that stain, but they want to make sure that their product's going to last so they're not getting callbacks. Mm -hmm. So you do want to make sure everything that goes on there is they're held accountable for it. Laura, do you have suggestions for a sealer for pure bond? Because I know they use those oils for a sealer. Um, I know the same credit has some really good sealer options. Great. Now, we started um, doing this about, I don't know, eight, eight years ago. We could find cabinets that weren't outrageous um, in cost that would do these products, not only the finish, but the, comp the composition of the chemical or the cabinet box. Mm -hmm. And so we just started having a guy locally build it. So we had a guy in Black Mountain building them. He was getting pure bond plywood from Old Ford. And then he was painting them himself with the paint that we respect. And it, it was not completely unaffordable, but it was awesome. I mean, that's as local as you can get right there. Can you say who he is? What's that? Can you mention who he is? Well, he's retired. Oh. <laughs> yeah, but um, over the last eight years of asking and asking and asking, mm -hmm. cabinet companies approaching us and then them not getting our work because we kept asking oh, for so it, now they figured out how to do it. So now it is relatively available and affordable. Mm -hmm. Just so you know, we do have one cabinet manufacturer that we use. They're a little more custom, high end, have a lot of the moldings and details and things like that, bells and whistles. And when you ask for their pricing for their low or no out of formaldehyde, low VOC, their price triples. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people think that it's really outrageous. And I think years past it was because the demand wasn't there, but because the demand is there now, a lot of companies are figuring out how do we, well, I think some of them are just taking advantage of the opportunity. Mm -hmm. you know, but um, a lot of it is really, really considerably affordable now. Also, a consideration with um, with plywoods, there are some options sometimes, maybe some particle boards that are pulled into um, closet systems versus plywood because it's a little more cost effective. Um, it might not flex as much as plywood or something like that. But there are, um, you want to make sure that it's CARB 2 compliant which is the minimum standard for California, which we want to make sure clear between. Because I think there are still some products out there that are carb. Carb one. Carb one or less or whatever. So just make sure that even if you're not using a low EOC, no matter if you're not plywood for your closet systems, definitely at a minimum look for carb two compliant. 
and for years our closet company said we can't get it, we can't get it. And so after years of hearing that, we said, all right, then we're not using it anymore. We've used them for 10 years. We're not using it anymore. And guess what? They found it. It's amazing. Unbelievable. They lost one job and they changed their entire business model. So, yeah. It's out there. It is. Countertops. Um, how many of you here have thought about the toxicity level of countertops? Granite? Mm -hmm. Yeah? So those are some good things. Like when it goes back to thinking that because it's natural, it must be good. You know, granite is a solid slab of stone. You do need to consider that it could be emitting radon, maybe small amounts, because it's been cut, it's out of the ground, it's not mm -hmm. circulation, but it can be. Um, and also, the ceilings on porous materials like granite are something that you do have to be really considerate of. Um, let's see, wood is porous, concrete is porous, granite is porous, marble, Anything that's a natural material really has those natural pores in it that actually soak up stains or you know oils or things like that that, that last so we want to seal it to protect it. But think about what that sealer is doing. Not many people are using laminate countertops anymore, but you know what that laminate is going over particle board. Mm -hmm. What's well, that, that held together with? Yeah, well, so like the formica or laminate is, itself is not necessarily toxic, but what is going on is. And being glued down with. May I ask a question? Yes. Um, there's also a kind of new type of countertops where they have cycle or recycle plastic. What about those? Is there any I would, I would be them? afraid of the plastic ones because this the you know, a lot of the things that we're hearing now is, you know, especially with the soft flexible plastics that, you know, there are Especially when they come in contrast with like water, plastic water bottles or something like that, they get heated up and then the chemicals are then put into the water and that sort of thing. So I would. They kind of have a process, do, like where they. Yeah, do your research. Yeah. One thing you consider we do have a lot of recycled countertops that are out there, um, glass, recycled glass. Quartz is actually a man made synthetic product in contrast to quartzite, which is a natural stone. Quartz uses quartzite and other things, bits and pieces of it, along with resins that can be toxic. So there is the preconceived notion out there that quartz countertops are great. They're very durable. Um, the majority of the time, they're heat resistant. Um, Cambria is LEED certified and non-toxic. And that is because they are higher quality quartz. They use more actual quartz and less resins and fillers to hold it together. Whereas the ones that are maybe more cost effective and don't go through that stringent process to actually make sure their products are healthy, quartz could be or could not be toxic. So you definitely want to consider that. You guys remember cultured marble countertops? <laughs> Did you ever smell one of those when it went in? Or when they were cutting the sinks? <laughs> wow. Really noxious. So I was just going to say, speaking of, of cutting, um, I just uh, read an article the other day about the quartz countertops and the more engineered stone countertops and how much more silica goes mm -hmm. into making those and how many people are getting sick from breathing in the silica. The fabricators. Yep. And um, how a lot of, there are certain companies that are really trying to to step up, you know, the indoor air quality of their warehouses so less people get sick. But once once you get that silica in your lungs, it doesn't ever get out. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, hopefully, a lot of manufacturers and fabricators do consider their employees' health mm -hmm. when it's being fabricated. But um, when it's getting sawn or grinded or whatever in the in the workshop. Those things are flying, but once it gets installed, then you know you shouldn't have the silica issue once it's installed. But that is something really important to consider is when you're purchasing, what are they doing on that side before you know, 
Yes. Um, for countertops, have you found any materials that are strike a sweet spot of clean, non-toxic, pretty, or is it just about the, about the least bad option? <laughs> stainless steel. Uh, stainless steel yeah. is a good option. Copper. Um, those are great. You know, it's, it, sometimes it depends on your budget and where it is laying because the cost of that is going to be a little higher than some of these other options. Concrete, depending on how it's made and what it is, concrete generally should be a healthy option depending on the sealers and that sort of thing. Um, wood is a great option. Yeah, butcher block. There are recycled things to do our top options out there now. Um, I think I haven't used it, but there was a marmolium option. It was just made cork. Mm -hmm. um, porcelain slabs are out there now, but they do have to get installed over plywood for the support and the structure. Mm -hmm. So the porcelain tile is great, but what do you do with it? All right. Anybody else have any input on countertops? Because there are a lot of options out here. Hard surface flooring and all wet areas and entry points. So this has to do with flooring materials that don't hold dust and moisture and pollutants and allergens and things like that. So hard surface flooring, getting rid of carpet, not just because of the product and the off-gassing and what the carpet's made of, but what happens over time. It grabs and holds onto lots of things. Um, it's easier to clean. Um, durable, but the, the biggest thing is the particulates that get trapped or not when you're doing hard surface flooring. So I want to know, as, as just kind of more of a, a trend kind of thing, how many people are doing tile still in laundry rooms or entries, mudrooms, all the bathrooms? Yeah. It's still, <laughs> I've got a client who's interested in wood floor in all their bathrooms. Well, you know, you may have an issue with the moisture in a couple spots. Well, they make, there's so many tiles now that look like wood. Look like wood. So. Mm -hmm. We've also had a client who's interested in tile throughout everywhere. Mm -hmm. From next. Florida? <laughs> they have to say it's all over and that was it. Yeah. I have wood or carpet. Mm -hmm. It's for their dog care. They would be able to Well people didn't have their dogs in their houses either because they were working. Okay, you're right. But they had they had floors that they could just clean and sweep out the door basically and throw the water on and sweep the water out spray it down. They also have open like they said, like you have a garden with an atrium going directly into the air in the middle of your house. Yeah. Second. Um, question about carpets. So if you do have carpet, like is regular cleaning effective and getting out whatever it's trapping? Meaning like professional cleaning? I would, but be careful with professional cleaning because right. they use a lot of chemicals. Right. Um, yeah. They all they claim that they're wet. pet and baby friendly though. No. Yeah, the moisture, the moisture is an issue. You can start cleaning off the walls too. You ever have carpet cleaning or you get moisture in your from the carpet cleaning? cleaning? From the carpet cleaning. Oh. <laughs> you have dry cleaning methods and not the strong suction method. Yes. So, can you speak on that? What was that? I'm sorry. Dry cleaning methods, dry product rather than steam cleaning. And uh, uh, truck mounted strong suction vacuums. My suction. My suction. That's 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 there's a clean product that a professional that carpet cleaners use. It's chrysanthemum. Oh. Do you get the smell of chrysanthemum? I don't know. I don't have carpets. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm going to go. It's supposed to be a low VOC or a mm -hmm. non toxic product. So if you do have clients or if you yourself do want the comfort and warmth of carpet underfoot, wool is recommended. Mm -hmm. It's, um, like we said, naturally 
flame retardant, flame resistant, especially if you've got an area right that's going up to in front of a wood burning fireplace. Mm -hmm. All the things we're not recommending. But um, if you do want something comfortable and warm and soft underfoot, um, you know, wool is the, the biggest thing. There are a lot of options out there that use natural dyes, um, like beetroot, things like that. Um, carpet, synthetic carpets, there are some carpets out there that are made, okay, PET, the recycled plastic, but you do want to do your research on, you know, what the off gassing is too. So there is the stewardship side of it, but then the health side that we're talking about now. All right, other flooring with wood floors. So the options for wood floors are solid floors. Pre-finished floors, which are finished on site somewhere. Site finished floors, where the installer comes and installs the wood, they sand and finish and do that multiple times to get the finish that you're looking for. And then you have engineered products, which could be finished on site or pre-finished as well. So with the engineered products, they have a plywood base where the different layers of plywood are turned different directions, they're glued together. That does increase stability for movement with moisture changes. So the lateral stability is increased with engineered products. And then when you're going on a concrete slab, a lot of times you will want to do an engineered floor, something if you do a wood floor on a slab, because of the moisture transference from a concrete slab. Mm -hmm. There are options for um, sealers to go down first, like a coating on your concrete floor. So make sure it's low in your VOC, whatever options there are. There are some good options that um, <coughs> Coda has and some other brands. But before you put that wood floor down, and that'll help be serve as kind of like a moisture barrier as well as you know glue the product down. We generally personally like to on the lower level glue versus float because of you know natural the variances in the concrete slab, but like Sean mentioned, vinyl floors, there are a lot of floating floors out there now that are vinyl or laminate that kind of hook and lock and they float, but that product itself is not really good for you. So really, if you're going to do a flooring, do a wood floor. If you can have it pre-finished or finished off-site somewhere so it can off gas there, then that's even better than doing it on-site. But the, really, the wood floor, tile, <coughs> stone. Sand and seal floors, you want to ask for a dust collection. So most floor sanding companies do not have a dust collector. It's expensive and it's a little bit cumbersome. But if you have them you have a dust collection system on that sander, how much better would it be for that poor guy that's sanding the floors? But think about all that sand. Um, or the dust that comes off that sander. Um, when we finish a home, we always tell our clients it usually takes three cleans. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because there's all that fine dust from the trim carpet and right from the flooring. So specify if you can when they're sanding the floors that they use a uh, dust collection system. Good point. Thank you. All right. Um, with different flooring products, the finishes that go, that go on there. Um, you know, there's the toxic kind of polyurethane that a lot of installers and finishers used to use. There is a natural oil now that's not necessarily durable, scratch resistant, all that sort of thing. But um, Rubio Monaco, for instance, is a great, great product that, you know, it takes a little more product to actually spread and a little more elbow grease for your finishers. So some, some of the guys out there or gals don't love working with it. <laughs> but what you Rubio Monaco. Mm -hmm. It soaks in the wood. If you do have a big dog or something and it scratches, you can actually take and rub on yourself and it just absorbs all <coughs> the raw wood is. Mm -hmm. So that's a great option for sand and snow on high floors, like Sean mentioned. And they have some great colors. You can order samples, do some test pieces, things like that, to make sure you like your color is right. Bone, 
but it has an oil option like that. Well, they have the same. The, the, to finish the floors with, like a lot of our builders will use bone if I have floors. And I think Minwax does have a water based stain that isn't as bad as the wool based. Yes, you're right. It's the one BSC option that Sean had mentioned earlier. I think one of our superintendents caught it on that job. Um, yeah, so it's not as healthy as some of the others, mm -hmm. like Ruby and Monaco to zero BSC. Oh. Um, Whereas the Minwax is low for that one, the one product. Low for the for the cutoff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's still higher than like paints and stuff. Though. Yeah. All right. Appliances. So there are many, many different options on the market now. Gas, apply, different fuel sources. Gas versus electric. Um, are there any others that are not missing? Steam versus electric. So gas versus electric. You know, anytime you can go electric, the better for you it is. Um, um, convection, not convection, for induction. Induction. Yeah. Thank you. The induction cooktops. Now I think a lot of people who've used gas all these years mm -hmm. are like, I really like my high heat. I insist on gas. Well, you know, we've lived with an induction cooktop for a few years now, and we will not go back. Um, not just because of the health considerations, but for energy considerations as well as cleanability. Um, it's better, more even cooking. Um, you can touch the hot eye without getting burnt because it only heats when you have the magnetic base hot on it. It still stays warm for a few seconds. Yeah. No, but not like. You do have to have special pots for it. They're pretty much all hybrid now. I mean, almost all hybrid. Yeah, they're they're pretty prevalent. I think when the induction first came out, there were just certain companies that were doing the induction pots or compatible pots. But I just bought some more on Amazon the other day that are pretty cost effective. So there are some options out there. When you do think about that, you do want to think about the coatings. I have twenty shops in my family. They are so fire coatings. Just all of them. Yeah, the fire. No. Well, if they insist on fire cooking, <laughs> insist on additional ventilation. Mm -hmm. um, well, sometimes they cook on fire afterwards. Like, so that's good. Yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of chefs switching to induction. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Good. All right, superior cooking. You're a fire cooker. Fire cooking. So you may just have to start cooking outside only. <laughs> this is my sister-in-law in El Salvador. Her kitchen is separate from her house. Uh -huh. So, like, the cooking is uh, oh, that That's interesting. Space. Mm -hmm. So it's the bathroom. Yeah, it's a little <laughs> interesting. Can I say any words on this? Oh, does that fire work? Well, that's good to know. I didn't know it, but I haven't tried it. It's hot, isn't it? Fast fire is. That is good in there. That's one of the things I think a lot of people miss with the cast iron, you know, specifically cast iron on gas. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Steam cleaner. Steam cleaners are. Um, They're becoming. They're entering the market to have a steam cleaner in the closets. Have you guys seen that? Um, dry cleaning, they use a lot of chemicals, and so if you get your clothes dry cleaning when you come home, you're wearing those. Yeah, so they've got these steam clean units now that you can build into your closet, which are awesome. Um, they're still a little bit pricey because it's not mainstream yet, but you literally put your shirts and your pants in there, and then it, it like presses them. And electrical use, electrical consumption for that piece of equipment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hang your clothes in your shower while you shower. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> Doesn't get my collar. Yeah, this one. All right, best construction practices. All right, first one is super easy. Anybody can do it. Does anybody know what a MERV is? Uh, so that's the. Uh, filtration uh, rating system on your filters and so um, the lower the number the less screening so when you 
used to pick up those filters and you you know you see that fiber mesh you can almost see through it those are like the lowest possible the good ones you pick up they look like paper pleats um, hospital grade is like a MERV 15 I think 13 or up is like superior you can um, choose this a couple different ways you go to Lowe's or Home Depot and you sell them now it used to be hard to find um, anything over like a MERV seven or eight off the shelf for all the different sizes and so i would go to filterbuy.com and i would just have them deliver a merv 13 um, for the size i needed every three months or however often you need them but now um lowe's has been carrying the higher mervs and so they're really pretty switch affordable. to where they actually have the merv rating on the filter because yeah. before you can yeah. only get a merv rated from ace hardware because Lowe's and Home Depot use their own little specific rating. You know, the little symbols on it. Yeah, like the FRP or whatever the letters were that they, I don't even remember now. But yeah, we used to just tell people go to Ace Hardware and those will have the <laughs> merge rating on it. Now, if you're building a new home where you're renovating and you're putting in a new HVAC system, you can actually install an ultraviolet electrostatic or plasma filtration <laughs> if you're really, if you've really got problems with um, allergies or congestion or anything like that. If you have pets, you might want to consider that the shed. But think about filtration on your air system. Um, we're talking about indoor air quality, but we also want to talk about water purification because we're talking about consumption in general. That's a concern. So if you have a well, have you ever tested that water? A lot of people have it, surprisingly. Um, even new wells, they should be tested, but sometimes I'll ask on my checklist, has the well water been tested, and it hasn't been tested yet. I'm like, holy cow, let's get this thing tested. So if it's well water, you want to get it tested, and then you'll get it treated. Um, you can put a sediment filter on those. If it's city water, you're going to want to filter it for chlorination and all kinds of other chemicals that they're putting in there. And so it's good just to have water filtration. You just want to think about that. Ferguson does free water testing too. Oh, really? That's great. Mm -hmm. We put in a Pelican water uh, filter system in our house because the plumber recommended it. And it was about $1,800. And man, we noticed a huge difference right after we put it in. And we're on city. Yeah, we're on city water, so we have municipal water supply. Yeah. And specifically when you're showering, you've got that hot water and the steam, and then you're breathing it. Mm -hmm. So, um, Anyways, we noticed the big difference. He was sold on them and he sold me on them. Um, duct leakage, so this is another easy one to do. Hire an energy rater and they're going to do this for you. But this is an easy way to increase the performance of your house and to help the indoor air quality of your house by checking for duct leakage by doing a duct plaster test. All right, this is something that's becoming a popular topic. And that is EMF detection or shields. So we're surrounded with electronics today. And um, people are wearing Apple Watches and talking on their cell phones and around computers and monitors all day. So um, people are concerned about that from the meter on their house, whatever it might be. So just think about um, when we do our walkthrough for our rough ends, we discuss this and we try to find a central location to do the router. We try to find drop or create drop zones so that when you walk into your house, whether it's the laundry room or the mud room or the master bedroom, you've got a drop zone where you can put your phone down or your iPad, plug it up and then leave it, and then walk into your space and actually relax. So you want to think about isolating those things, maybe in a closet or in certain areas, but ideally you don't want electronics next to your bed or where you're sleeping. I think it's a range of eight feet from your bed as you're sleeping. So iPads, cell phones, whatnot, at least eight feet away from where you are. So there's not a lot of data on this yet, so this is just something to just consider. Mm -hmm. um, ventilation is key. It really is. Laura was talking earlier about construction practices of old homes. They just put the house together. They weren't thinking about this. But the homes are draftier, and so they did ventilate, and they didn't have air conditioning, so they would have all the windows open all the time, so they had plenty of ventilation. Well, today we're all comfortable with our air conditioner and our heat. We've got our windows shut, so we're breathing all this stuff. You want to ventilate your house. A great way to do that is with um, operable skylights. 
Velux makes a, um, an option for solar powered shades and operation, and they're awesome. Uh, they actually can have settings where you sense if your house has got humidity or moisture built up inside and it'll ventilate it out, or if it's certain different times of day, it'll open uh, our shades or close the shades. So it's a great way to ventilate, plus it's up on the roof, and so Laura's solution earlier about doing an exhaust fan on the vaulted ceiling of your kitchen. So you could do that. You could certainly do a skylight that would open. And there is a rain sensor on the operable one, so if it does start raining, it closes. But you know, just anybody can do this. When you get home, you can just open up your doors and kind of ventilate the house for a few minutes while you're cooking or whatever. Cooking's a great time to do that, right? Just get some ventilation throughout for your, um, you may have some combustion going on. Door mats. So one year for the Parade of Homes, um, I think the year I was president, we gave out door mats to everyone that had a home. <laughs> have the HBA logo on it, but it's a good idea to have floor mats because again, you're, you want to wipe your feet before you go in. You want to clean your shoes off. Even if you're going to take your shoes off, let's clean them off before you go in. Remove any transfer of toxins or dander or Gershaw, whatever you've been walking through. <laughs> and then um, when we're designing homes, tying in with that drop zone concept, in the lawn here, mud area, we like to design a place where you can sit down and take your shoes on and off. So ideally, you come in, sit down, take your shoes off, stick them under the bench, plug in your phone or your iPad or whatever, and then arrive inside your home. Um, we're even doing some dog showers where you can clean your shoes in there, as well as your pet, which is kind of cool. So these are these are kind of some behavioral strategies you want to educate your clients on or you as the consumer want to think about. This is one that people don't think about, that's pharmaceutical storage. That's a problem today, isn't it? So if you want to create a safe environment inside your house, this is obviously particularly for uh, those that have children living in the home. But think about pharmaceutical storage and providing a safe and secure place to lock it up. is a real problem today with opioids. So regardless what it is, it could be abused. So a safe practice would be to figure out a way to lock up. It's easy to do that with a medicine cabinet with a lock on it. Trash storage. So it sounds like common sense, but most of us store our trash cans inside the garage. That's better than storing up inside your house. <laughs> But still in your garage, you're, you're walking in and smelling it. We keep ours right outside. So here we have to think about bears. But, um, just think about your trash storage and just think about just a focus on your indoor air quality, or what you're breathing in, and is it being filtered? Do you have ventilation? Um, that kind of segues into central vacuums. Central vacuums are a really good um, opportunity to increase the indoor air quality of your house, and they become incredibly affordable. Just a couple thousand dollars you can do your whole house. A push behind vacuum of high quality would be pretty close to that. So central vac, you can have dust pans, um, the old dust pan where you actually sweep and put it underneath your toe kick. They actually have where you can open your cabinet door and pull out a hose, and it's kind of like a shop vac. You can suck everything up. And the point is you can locate the canister in the garage so it's outside of your building envelope and all the dust is out there inside that canister. And when you change the canister, it's in your garage, it's not in your house. So a central vac is a good option. And they have options for the type of bag or not. So there are, there are options where the bag will seal itself when you pull it out. <coughs> so dust and whatever doesn't come out of the bag as you're emptying it, so you're not exposed. There are options where it just goes into the canister and you have to go dump it. You know, obviously you've got a lot more exposure at that point. So if that's not something you consider, it's, um, it's a pretty good option for anywhere at all. Well, they do have options too now to where it's not just the hose that you have to carry around. They do have the ones that are what they call the hide a hose that suck up into the wall. Mm -hmm. And you just pull it out of the wall. And then the, the best thing you can do 
if you're building a home or if you're a builder or you're a designer or you're an architect, architects are great at this, the rest of us are not as good, is writing specifications. And if you're hiring somebody, you want to ask, do you have specifications? If so, can you read them? So when clients ask me, what am I getting for my money? I can print this document off and it's every spec for everything that would go into their house. This is an example. This is all in our software. So each line item that goes into a house has a cost code. That's how we track the billing. Um, and that's how we track the budget. And that's also how we attach an associated specification. So these specifications are what we're giving to our trades, our subs and vendors. And they are supposed to follow when they price the house and when they execute it. What's the software you use again? Co-construct. Co-construct. Yeah. There's several different out there um, that kind of all do something similar. Uh, this is just the one we use. So to answer your question about how do you execute this, start with the spec. Write the specification and make sure, and we always are tweaking this, right? So every time we learn something, we're always finding something better or we find a certain product that we like, you can specify that product. But then this needs to be sent out when you have an estimate request. So a request for a proposal, RFPs, whatever you want to call it. The spec should go with it. They should price it according to your spec. And then you have to have somebody diligent to follow through and make sure that it's actually being done. And that's the trick. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's good to have an energy rater partner. They're going to be your biggest advocate. But you still have to have somebody on site every single day making sure that they're checking these things. Well, and like the paint instance earlier, you know, that's one of our trades. So, you know, we are passing the information along to their crew leaders, but sometimes there might be a language barrier. So we need to st you still need to check up and look sometimes. That's still my question. Um, in the case of your company, if you don't mind sharing it, so you pass on the spec and so paint that floor with this or seal it or whatever. So in doing it or about to do it, is there a person like an organization that looks at this label and talks to this guy and has that translator that says, yay, barely, you've got exactly the right thing. That's what I was just saying. Someone needs to be on site every day doing that. For us, it's a superintendent. Yeah. Okay, that's what that was. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you have a body that does yeah. that. That's part of it. Yeah, you know, it won't happen even if you do have a superintendent. Half the time, they may miss it. But you got to have somebody there every day doing yeah. that. Exactly. And checking labels, and that's what the rater does. The rater will come and check the labels. So the super has to provide the labels to the rater. In advance of the allocation. Either during or after, they have to provide that for verification to get the certification, mm -hmm. which provides the incentive to make sure that it was actually done right at the beginning with the superintendent. And then before that, it starts with the specification. Mm -hmm. So if you don't start with that, you're never going right. to get there. Right. You start with this, you're down the right path, mm -hmm. and you have to make sure you stay on that path with supervision. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'll, I'll definitely say, I mean, Livingstone, they've been around for a long time. They built, a, you know, a number of houses, and so they've developed relationships with all of their subcontractors and have expectations that all of their, for all of their subcontractors, and they figured out which products meet the requirements. They've been doing these certifications for so long that they've figured out which products meet the requirements that they're looking for. So it's just kind of second nature that yes, we're using the same stuff again because it works. So if someone just starting out, it's you know it's going to take longer to work all the kinks out and find out all that information, but these guys have, have streamlined it pretty well. The question is, as far as mechanisms, um, if you're not using living stone, you're somewhere else, Curious is if your client can one inquire about the on-site supervision fee per week. You know they're obviously charged to have someone on site and make sure. You know, no, I'll pay a little bit extra if these things happen. And my other question—that's more of a statement than a question. But the question, I guess, would be: Do you hold retainage on any of the subs, like a little bit of retainage, to ensure that they don't do what they were contracted to do, then they don't get paid fully? Or is that a mechanism that works? Or yes and yes. <laughs> yep. Yes. Yeah, you definitely want to hold out until you find out. Yeah. And that's why it's good because if you don't have a rater, you don't know that someone's actually going to check. And you may have all good intentions of checking, but there is a lot of stuff to check. And so that rater pays for their stuff and doing all that. 
and they're pros, they know what to look for, and they also give us guidance and counsel. They'll come out and do on-site inspections, it's worth every penny. But yeah, you gotta pay for supervision on inspections. So I'll just kind of go through this real quick, just to give you an idea, because we mentioned this was the biggest component, the biggest off-gasser before furnishing the home. So this is the biggest off-gasser during the design and build process. Cabinetry itself. Cabinetry itself, mm -hmm. yeah. So for us, it's line 6410, that's our cost code. <clears throat> Labor materials to install all cabinetry per plans. Many, and so, so I'll back up right there. We'll have the architect's plans, and then one thing that often changes on that is the layout of the kitchen. So the clients will work with our interior designers and they'll go through their house photos, they'll go through their form and function. And so very often based upon the appliances, that kitchen uh, scenario will change and that those kitchen drawings will be done. And so we're referencing that right off the bat, check those drawings and notes. And then we're saying manufactured cabinets must be KCMA ESP certified, Kitchen Cabinet Manufacturers Association Environmental Stewardship Program, or must use ultra low emitting formaldehyde or no added urea formaldehyde plywood, such as plywood, such as pure bond, pure bond, pure bond plywood, or an approved alternative. The Green Raider must approve all alternatives. So we're writing in there that you have to get permission. Yes, Alice. I just going to say something like you mentioned that the, the superintendent would make it sure or the reader would make it sure. But in my practice, because I'm an architect, I do the specifications mm -hmm. and I also do the site visits. So there is that pathway also when the architect makes it sure. That's right. That, that all the subs, they comply with the specifications. Yeah, it goes back to someone has to do the supervision. Yeah. In your case, you can do it. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So custom cabinets must use low emitting, ultra low emitting formaldehyde or no added urea formaldehyde plywood such as pure bond plywood. So um, we just uh, read that part. The selections coordinator will coordinate the cabinet designs, finishes, and drawings per the owner, with the owner per the allowance. All cabinets shall have soft closed doors and drawers. All tall cabinets and wall cabinets shall have crown molding. All ca kitchen cabinets shall have tall panels around the refrigerator. A double trash pullout. Why is that? We uh, check it to encourage people to recycle. Trash and recycling. So we're requiring that. As, this is all to be estimated to begin with. So we're asking for all these things from the very start. We're saying we want two cans, trash and recycling. Um, Cabinet panel for the back of islands, minimum 42 inch tall wall cabinets, and light brown on all wall cabinets. Cabinet provider will provide matching shoe mold for cabinet areas as part of an allowance. Cabinet provider will cover all cabinets with durable materials that will protect the installation from bumps and uh, defects and might occur on a normal construction job site. So that's just an example of one spec. This is what we're expecting when you price something. So don't give us a little budget that doesn't include these things and then say these are going to be upgrades later. We want green cabinets from the beginning and we want a recycling capability and we want them protected when you're done. Mm -hmm. Are all of these decisions in some ways coming from you as the builder saying, I want to build to this level of quality? Yes. Okay. Yeah, but then we've got to create that culture where everybody buys it and yeah. understands it and wants to support it. So that's the challenge. Yeah. You can dictate not have buying, you gotta get that buying. And, yeah, great question. And then just um, affiliated information, you can view or add comments here in the software so that the subcontractor, if we have them, they can come in and they can say, I've got this product ready for you. We can attach a PDF so when they're done um, getting quotes from several different cabinet vendors, they'll upload those quotes for the client to come in here and the client can go on and they can make choice and it'll affect their budget, and it'll add to it or subtract from it, and then that uh, changes the, um, the budget to actual in the software, which is all nice. But it's all there documented is the point. So you're, you're wanting documentation, this is a great way to document. And the trade, not just the builder or the superintendent, but the trades are also included on this. So they are responsible, and we've expressed it to them, that they are responsible the day of installation, whatever it is, double check what's on the construct first because they're responsible for what's on there and if they don't do that then 
They have to get the plans, the blueprints, all that stuff is all here. Furnishings. No one buys a sofa saying, I want to get cancer. Looking for comfort, not cancer. And that's, um, you know, it's really a shocking statement, but it's really the truth that I think has been washed over so much for so many years. Um, a statistic is that 85% of couches contain chemicals linked to cancer, neurological, and reproductive harm. So aside from just, I mean, thankfully, you had a reaction that yeah. you knew that it was external, not necessarily internal or whatever. Yeah, it I was. could not sit on that couch without sneezing and feeling tightness in my chest. It was very strange. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's, well, I'm glad you related the two. Yeah. And not thinking, you know, I'm just I'm having an allergy. I had a client a month ago tell me about a bed they had bought one time. So you're not alone. Well, I'm thankful for it because you know it opens your mind to the, mm -hmm. like I said, the products that we use. Yeah, a lot of times it's you know out of sight, out of mind. If you don't see it or have some way of it getting your attention, you know, otherwise you really don't know. All right. If we build a green home for our client and then they fill it with furniture that is made with toxins, the wellness circle is detrimentally <coughs> disrupted. Um, Sometimes we've got clients who have lots of things that they bring with them. Sometimes we have clients who want to start from scratch. Um, sometimes there are heirlooms or you know whatever there may be. But um, furniture and furnishings are responsible for a large part of indoor pollution because they are filled with added formaldehydes and other VOCs. Um, let's see. I'm going to, so this will break down a little bit of all the different components in furniture. But um, we've got fabrics, we've got the cushions, what are those made of? We've got, um, you know, the foundation of the piece. Is it plywood? Is it solid wood? Um, what goes into finishing the woods or the legs or the metals that are, that are a part of the piece? Um, the fabrics themselves, how are they dyed? Are there any applications um, for fire resistant or anything like that put on it. Um, fabrics from upholstered goods are traditionally filled with chemicals to retard stains and flammability, while the frames and cushions are filled with glues, resins, and other off-gassing finishes. This applies to all types of furnishings from upholstered items to case goods to area rugs, pillows, anything. Um, case goods are the wood pieces or the hard pieces like dressers, chests, that sort of thing. There are also some misconceptions about the meaning of building and living green. The word natural again comes up when we talk about leather. It's natural. And back to fabrics, you know, you can have a linen fabric or a cotton fabric with a flame resistant application on it or stain resistant application on it. I think a lot of people with kids and pets think, you know, I want this to last and not stain and, you know, be able to be easily cleanable and things like that, but it's really um, sometimes detrimental to your health. Is there, is there a meter or some way to measure VFCs on the furniture? Any kind of question? Or That's a good question. Not that I'm aware of. Um, I do know one thing that if you've got antiques, or something like that, that if, that if you're, not, you're not refinishing, right, or anything, something toxic, something like that. Old stuff, off gases elsewhere, or it's had its time, and you know, old things are sometimes really good to put in your home. But when you have upholstered things, there, I mean, there are things that can off gas for years and years. So you, you do want to consider what's the history of the piece, and how is it made. Well, I think um, if it's a piece of furniture, you can you can uh, make an envelope, mm -hmm. and then there are tests for formaldehyde for specific mm -hmm. toxins. So that that's the only thing I know. That's good to know. You bring a flight on site. Um, how smart is your sensor? What can your sensor test? What can it? Test? Mm -hmm. Or what can it test? Can it test? So it's difficult to detect for what all could be in the right. products on site. So like Aaron said, it's yeah. considered taking a, a sample in a glass jar mm -hmm. and send it off to a lab where they, they can check for lots of things at the lab. Mm -hmm. um, that's all for the I would I would think about maybe legitimacy or um, accuracy of 
whatever the tester is, because I can hand you this and say, this will be good, there's from all of that. But um, send it off to a lab, something like that, where they can verify and give you the report or something. It's not too difficult to do a formaldehyde test. You can do that yourself through a right. company called True, True Check, is it? And you can order their little air pump um, sample or and their, oh. their glass mm -hmm. device, and you can do mm -hmm. some chemical testing yourself. Formaldehyde is not a bad one to start with. But beyond that, all the other chemicals that could, that could be off gassing, better off just to, as an air sample to lab, because there are so many devices that you bring out to the house. Yeah, that's, that's good. Start with formaldehyde. Okay, and what was the name of the device? Is it True Check? True. Home Air Check. 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 Go on site and they can order a, um, a little air pump and their little glass capsules. And they can at least check the formaldehyde to start with that one. Let's get it. I'll check that out. All right, leather. Um, the tanning process is really highly toxic. Um, not to mention that you know a lot of us want to be consumers of not just the, the earth, but also animals and other life forms. And um, but you know a lot of times leather is really popular. It's nice. It's easily cleaned. But there are some synthetic options out there that really look like leather you like leather and are non-toxic. There are certain manufacturers that <laughs> specifically specialize in imitation leather that is healthy. All right, um, look for brands that are like flame retardant free, fully recyclable, and they use water-based adhesives and finishes. Seek out quality furnishings that are smart, healthy, and responsive Responsible by choosing companies that use solid and F or FSC certified wood, certified organic textiles, natural latex, jute, hemp, wool, goose feathers and down. One thing to consider with the solid wood, um, yes, the F FSC, Forest Sustainability Council. Um, that's great for great stewardship, but you also want to consider Green Guard certified because they do test all those chemicals and things before you purchase and before it's made. Make sure it, they are responsibly making these things. But also a solid wood frame on a sofa versus the legs that screw in. The difference is, is that the frame is really built out of parts and pieces of wood, but usually plywood. And that's the part that gets covered up that you don't see and then those legs screw in. If it's a solid wood frame, you know those legs are built up into the frame and it's built out of just solid wood. So that is something to consider. You know, the cost does go up a little bit, but when it's a solid wood frame, it's going to last longer. It's going to be more of an airline quality piece. With the, with the cushions, here, you know, we have a lot of memory foam that's popular. It can be really, really toxic. There are options out there now that are, um, that are, well, it's F F SFC certified, Sustainable Furnishing Council. I know I keep getting this to me, so. Um, so there are options for your cushions that are natural latex, which is a natural product. Um, and then also, let's see. Yeah, foam and natural latex, and I think there is one other option that is not as popular because it's not really as durable as those two. So versus foam, look for natural latex. Yeah, I'm talking about that inside cream, what that is. Yes. All right, so also something to consider, you know, your seat cushions are something to consider, but also the filler that goes around them doing something that is natural like down or cotton or wool. And that's what they call the batting, B-A-T-T-I-N-G. The batting that goes around the actual core of the cushion. So those are things that you would consider cotton, wool, um, hemp, I think is one of those. Yeah, or down. Some people who have a lot of allergies could be allergic to down feathers or dust mites that love the down feathers and things like that. So you may want to just stick with no down or um, cotton or wool. That's sort of thing specified now, but down is a natural alternative as well for those who can tolerate it. 
Um, the inside green. This is actually something a program that our furniture manufacturer that we we partner with exclusively and through Atelier Maison for the store that we're opening this spring. They have an option to where you can choose any of their pieces of furniture and have it inside green, meaning they use the natural latex. They give you an option of down or not. Um, solid frame, no VFC, no, no hydrophenolic products. Um, stains are all healthy. The fabrics are linen or cotton or wool. The dyes are all non-toxic. So no flame retardants, no stain resistance, and um, and it was really, really and amazing to us. All right. <laughs> yeah, really, really great company. And actually, they just got the top award mm -hmm. for, that, for the SFC, the highest level score that the SFC gives on their inside grade. All right, an example of a solid and oak frame. So you can see here there's no plywood. They use these struts here and they've got um, solid boards. So as you, you can see with the grain there, it's you know one by or something like that. This one's got this one does specifically have scrum feet, but a lot of times do you think if there are scrum feet, generally there is plywood. And if there is plywood, make sure it's pure bond or something comparable. All right, here is a little more information on the materials that we have discussed already. But in addition to comfort and lifespan, these products can be inherently flame retardant without the use of chemicals. In the event one is allergic to any of these natural materials or a byproduct thereof, like dust mites, there are some conscientious manufacturers that offer certified non toxic and synthetic alternatives. So, mentioning foam. There are some options out there now that are certified green guard. All right, solutions for whole living. Everybody doing good? Mm -hmm. All right, we're on the home stretch, so we're going to take some nuggets home, hopefully. Um, so, how do we do this? What, what are, We've already given you some solutions, right? We've talked about the problem and how you can overcome them. Um, maintaining the long-term health of the build long after it is finished is hugely important to having a healthy home. This means implementing suggested behavioral strategies such as using non-toxic cleaners, locking up chemicals, cleaning vents and ductwork regularly, removing shoes, and doing a deep clean twice a year. So when we move a client into their home, we do an orientation. We teach them how to use their home. We teach them, we go through every room. We ask them if, you know, whatever questions they have. We show them how GFCI, GFCI outlets work. We talk about their electrical panel, talk about uh, how their appliances work. And then we give them a gift basket. We give them essential oils, which is you know, a natural way to kind of heal and clean. Uh, we give them a non-toxic cleaning kit. Myers is a great brand. Um, we talk about living green, so we talk about their certifications for their home, and we talk about how they can keep it clean by doing some of these behavioral strategies. We explain why we do the drop zones, and it just creates an awareness that maybe they didn't have before, that they're gonna go into this new house to potentially change their behaviors. So main sources of everyday household VOCs. Anything that sprays, how is it spraying? You know, is it a pump or is it an aerosol? Aerosol are giving off CFCs, right? So we know those aren't good. So you want to think about that. <laughs> Cleaning supplies are probably the most toxic thing in your house. And so when it comes to that, you want to think about what products are there. I mentioned Myers just a second ago. Myers is one of several, I'm sure. Myers is just one that we use. We use the hand soap and we buy a cleaning product kit. We give it to our clients in their gift basket. And you um, can make natural DIY cleaners with essential oils or vinegar yeah. or something like that. Tea tree. Yeah, and then think about um, where chemicals would be stored in your house and how they could be locked up so they're not accessible to little ones. Disinfecting agents, air fresheners. 
So we work with a group called Wellness Within Your Walls, and Jillian was doing a study with uh, Prince Charles over in England, and they built this completely zero VOC home, and they had someone live in it for a year. They tested it, and then they had someone live in it for a year or more. They came back and tested it and tested for VOCs. So like, well, how can that be? So come to find out, he was using an air freshener. Like this plug-in ones? Like a Glade. So those are emitting fumes that you shouldn't be breathing. Um, cosmetics, stored fuels, we all have them. But think about where you might store them. Store them outside of the building envelope. Automotive products, those are pretty much all chemicals, right? Pesticides, we talked a little bit about that. Dry clean clothing, we talk about that. Fabric cleaners, um, there's a reason why they're cleaning something. They're, they've got some type of chemical reaction that they're gonna be, um, it's gonna be happening. Plastic, electronic devices. What about candles? Mm -hmm. So yes. candles can actually be a polluter mm -hmm. if they have fragrance or something added to them. Plus, it's a little bit of combustion, but you just got it's mostly whatever's added to it that's burning that you're breathing, right? Mm -hmm. Does the oils come off of the you know, paraffin-based candles? Candles. Mm -hmm. so, some folks suggest that they use a soy-based yeah. instead of um, paraffin-based. Yeah. So we give um, we give the oil kit with a diffuser, mm -hmm. so that's how people get use it in the house. Another misconception is the belief that if a home is built in a healthy way, then a healthy environment is insured. While a green built home helps at the onset, it's up to the homeowner to maintain a clean and green home that is healthy and well maintained for its occupants. So that's why we educate them on what we've done. We talk about the design process, we talk about the building process, I hand them their certifications, and then we talk about you know, how they can live going forward. We also want to um, bring a, a conscience, I guess we want to bring to their conscience what they're bringing into the house as far as furnishings are related. Because when you think about buying that media cabinet at Target or Walmart, and you bring it home and then you can smell it, take it out of the box, that's typically it's all particle board. So we want to bring awareness to that too. Uh, living practices that should be considered Cleaning chemicals, we talked about that. Um, Laura mentioned green guard products, and so um, the easiest way to tell if something is uh, low VOC is if it's been green guard certified. So that is a great way. When our framers are gluing down their plywood, they have to use green guard uh, adhesives. Furnishings, air fresheners, we recommend to deep clean twice a year. Duct cleaning on occasion. So I have a question about if you have one of those centralized vacuum systems, how do you clean that ductwork? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's okay. because, well, I mean it is, but it's because it's, it it's a vacuum that goes away from the house. I don't think that's you don't probably think there's a, nothing that builds up in there. I don't think that's a concern. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I had a, a central vacuum system in a home I had, and uh, the only problem with it was when like a, the bobby pin would get stuck in it or something, a little mm -hmm. pencil, or sure. the children, you know, a little toy. That is really hard to remedy. So that's the only... You want to keep a good relationship with your installer. <laughs> <laughs> something that's often overlooked is having live house plants. Mm -hmm. They're creating oxygen, right? There's a, there's a process there. And they clean your air. They're basically scrubbing your air, right? We talked about opening your windows and doors. We've not really talked about radon testing. Before the class started, we were talking a little bit about this. You won't know if you have radon until after your home is built and it's closed up and you can test it. That's if you even do test, which is amazing because it's not required, so most people aren't testing. Um, we will build in a neighborhood and we'll have radon in that house and not in that house. Yeah. So what we do is we uh, put a passive radon system in every home we build. Mm -hmm. So the pipe goes in the slab, the plumber runs it, he runs the vent up and out the roof, if at all possible. And so we are passively venting any radon gas. Radon is the breakdown of granite in the ground. 
We talked about how it can wake up into your house, right? And those fumes can come up. You could be breathing in, not even know. And then, um, so we put in a passive rate on pipe. It's like three or four hundred dollars extra to have our plumber do that from the beginning. It's just like an extra sewage pipe. If we have a big house and there's a footing running down the middle, we'll put two because we want to make sure that it's getting gas from the entire foundation. And at the end of the house, at the end of the construction, we will bring in a radon tester, or we might even get a do-it-yourself kit if the client's not there and the house is not being opened and closed, right? So we get a reliable reading. We'll test it. If it comes in over four, then that is considered dangerous. And we will have our radon mitigator come in and put a uh, vent or a fan in the vent to make it an active system. One thing to consider with that is putting in the passive vent to begin with and putting in an outlet where the fan would go. Okay, really easy to do. But if you think about it, number one, you're forcing yourself to check. And number two, if you do have radon as a dangerous level over four, then you don't have to go in and retrofit and cut up your concrete, drill through your drywall, go out the side of your house and have this big ugly vent pipe like our neighbor has. We, I look out the window and that's what we see, their vent pipe coming straight up their house. Ours goes through the walls and out the roof and they're the vents, you don't even see it. So that's something that's easy to do if you think about it up front. You guys are asking about resources. This is a couple of good ones that we've used over the years. Toxicfreefurniture.org or future.org. Toxicfreefuture.org. Wellnesswithinyourwalls.com. And then EPA has always got a ton of information because they have basically unlimited budgets, right? EPA.gov slash indoor air plus. And also the Green Guard website, so you can just Google Green Guard. Yeah, Google and Green Guard, you'll get a ton of information. Does anybody have any questions that we didn't answer? Are you sharing the slideshow with us? Do you have an email or something? Can we do that? Too? Yeah, absolutely. If you guys are willing to share. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Carrie will take care of that for you. Carrie does everything. <laughs> uh, windows for ventilation, uh, casement versus awning. Which which is better for ventilation? For I think it depends on the application and the location of the house. Um, so awnings are great, but it just depends on the use. Casements are easier to use than double hung, and you get a lot more opening and ventilation with a casement versus a double hung. Um, but awnings have a specific use that are great, uh, really good for ventilating. Good, what else? Sometimes there's a code requirement that like an awning won't give you enough of an opening in a bedroom. Yeah, and that's it. Do you have any more practices that you put into play during construction to mitigate bad effects on installers or workers or any laborers coming in and out of the house? So um, it goes back to the earlier question here. You know, the best thing you can do is have specification, but if you're not a builder, I guess it's a one time. It's not. Um, you want to look for somebody that does have specifications. That's going to be the kind of like the top rung of the ladder. Yeah. Then the next one is going to be um, educating yourself so you understand what to look for. And then the next rung down, I think, would be making sure you have somebody that's supervising, whether it's the architect or designer or builder or owner. I always specify a tobacco-free job site. And then lastly, if you use an energy radar, they're kind of like your last line of defense or your first line of defense, depending on how you look at it. But the readers do a lot of that for you. I'm curious, um, from like a building and an aspiring builder, how you went from, oh, I'm going to build houses to building greenhouses. And obviously, it's culturally going on in Nashville. But um, how did you start to work with subs and build that culture to you know, build this team? Great question. So my father was a Marine Corps officer. I was taught if you're going to do it, do it right. So I can't stand to do the same thing twice. So I always believe learn from your mistakes and do something better the next time. So if you build a house, the next time take your mistakes and improve upon them. So as, as we heard about the Green Building Council starting 
and certifications coming out, we thought, well, that just makes sense. Don't you want to live in a house that's better for you? So we started with that right off the bat. We did Energy Star and Green, and then we added Indoor Air Plus to that, and then we kind of thought about what happens after the client moves in. So it's an evolution, mm -hmm. you know, and so our, our trades understand that, that we want to be cutting edge and leading the market, and they like being part of that. 